Shalom, guys, and welcome. I'm sorry, I did something wrong here with the um, with the uh, with the live. I want to make sure that you're here with me, and I'll fix it later. But I apologize about that. Um, let me repeat what I was trying to say earlier. As I was talking to somebody on Facebook, just exchanging and stuff, uh, the typical arguments, and I was trying to quote verses, but it seems like the verses are no longer good enough. Someone made a comment, and I don't name names. I'm just somebody who is not in ministry. And it says, there's no biblical evidence of verses that supports the sons of Aaron as the priests or in the millennial reign. And I'm thinking, wow, people don't read anymore. So I've been thinking about this all day long, and I was doing all the teachings, and I felt in my heart I needed to share this with you. And all we're going to do is read verses. I'm just going to read all kinds of verses, give you the other side of the coin. Now, spiritual application of what I think the Bible says we are, or who we are, where we're going. But what the God says, what his Bible says, what his scripture says. If we are a kingdom that still respects the word of God, we have to understand and recognize his authority. And whatever God ordains, we have to abide by those things. Now, let me make some disclaimers right off the get-go. First of all, clearly the book of Hebrews is talking about Yeshua in the order of Melchizedek. Any of us who believe in the Messiah will not disregard that. That's not the topic. Yeshua, as a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, is the whole context of the book of Hebrews. But even Hebrews chapter 10, verse 11, and verse, and we're going to read a lot of verses. So if you don't want to do a study, you can happily leave. Because people argue and they don't read the Bible. It's all about opinions. It's all about interpretations. It's all about a spiritual. No, let's look at the Bible. Let's go back to, to like the, the grassroots of our faith. Because within all this, a new religion is developing amongst the Hebrew roots. They are now a Melchizedek priesthood being baptized in some places in Midwest America. And this, I'm not going for that. I'm not going for that. So we need to let the Bible speak. So Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to read from verse 10 to verse 15. Now I want you to pay attention to what it says. Do I believe Yeshua did the role of the high priesthood? Absolutely. Is the book of Hebrews in the context of the Day of Atonement? I do believe so. Is it talking about everyone? Or is it only talking about Yeshua? I believe it's talking about Yeshua as a high priest in the heavenly tabernacle. We're clear on that. The question is, are you and I high priests according to the order of Melchizedek? That's what we need to examine biblically. And does that stand according to Scripture? I'm going to ask you the question right off the get-go. Show me one verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, well, chapter 2, verse 10, does not apply because it's talking to the ten tribes of Israel in Asia Minor. It's not even talking about the Melchizedek priesthood. It's talking to the diaspora, the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who lived in Asia Minor. The introduction of 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 tells you it's talking to the dispersion. It's not talking to Gentiles. Surely not people from America coming into the gospel and the Torah now usurping the authority that God established, ordained, and sanctified. So we're going to allow scripture, define scripture. And after this study is over, and it's not going to take just one hour, it's going to go a little longer. We need to reevaluate whether or not we are still doing what is right according to the, to the things that God wants us to do. We still need to reevaluate those things. We need to recognize, this, are we following what God said? Are we doing what God is telling us? Or are we re redefining God's commandments, doing whatever we think we're supposed to do? Or are we back in the times of the judges, doing according to the imaginations of our heart? Please share this post with everybody. Everyone that likes to argue about Melchizedek, please be strong enough to sit here and allow me the, the honor to share the other side of the coin that no one wants to talk about. As a temple researcher and as um, studying under my teacher, uh, Joseph Good who's been studying the temple for 43 years. I've learned a lot about uh, encroachment, kedusha, holiness, certain things and terms that you learn as you read scripture. The book of Hebrews tells us in chapter 10, verse 9 through, uh, through verse 15, that Yeshua is no longer the, doing the role of the high priesthood. He did that once and for all. This is the bomb I'm sharing with you right now. I'm not saying he did not do the role of the high priest because he did. But if, the, if, if he did it once and for all, like it says, he's not officiating every day. He did it once and it's over. Now he sits at the right hand. Let's read it. By that will we have been sanctified 
By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Yeshua the Messiah once for all. Verse 11. And every priest stands ministering daily and offerings repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Because the Torah was not designed to bring an offering and a sacrifice to remove willful rebellion or the penalty of willful rebellion, which is death. Okay, That's why Yeshua had to do that in the heavenly tabernacle. There was no way of forgiveness on the earth except for the king, for God to forgive. That's the only way. And that's what the whole Day of Atonement was. But there was no sacrifice. In the Day of Atonement, the way that used to remove the abominations and the, uh, the uh, uh, defilement in the tabernacle was by the high priest placing the hands on the Azazel, the scapegoat for the Azazel. He will confess the sins of Israel and he will take it outside of the camp away. Because there was no sacrifice for that. The other goat that was dedicated for the Lord, it was its blood was introduced into the Holy Holies in order to ratify the covenant, to continue the covenant, and then God will say, I forgive. That's just the way it was. 16, uh, chapter 16 of the book of Leviticus, verse 21 tells us about this. Because the sins of Israel defiles the temple. All right. Verse 12. But this man, Yeshua, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, let me read it again. But this man, Yeshua, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sacrificed. So if we're really going to go to the nitty-gritty of what it says, Yeshua already did the role of the high priesthood once. He's not doing that anymore. He sits at the right hand of the Father. When he returns, he will be king on the earth. And the Torah prohibits. The Torah does not allow a king priest at the same time. It's called encroachment. The Hasmonean family did that, and they paid heavily for it. We need to understand biblical law. Okay? Please allow me to, exp uh, to expand, to expound, and to share what I'm learning here with you, okay? Now, I'm going to quote you a whole bunch of verses. Because, you see, it seems to me that right now the whole body of Messiah is only responding to, te uh, to messages that are just spiritual. Forget about facts. Forget about what the Bible says, what God says. No, it's about what I feel, what I think, what I think something tells me in the air. Guys, the Word of God is eternal. God is forever. His words of my king, the words of my king, are forever established in the heavens. And no man can do away with them. Not even Yeshua the Messiah can do away with the decrees that God established on Mount Sinai. We need to get that straightened out. Okay, so let's look into the evidence. But first, let me ask you some questions. How come Yeshua, after the resurrection, not once in the New Testament narrative, said anything about the high priesthood? He never mentioned Melchizedek. He never mentioned the disciples that they are now priests in the order of Melchizedek. For 40 days, we have hardly any information other than Acts chapter 1 and, Bur and Burley of chapter 2. And some of the things in the gospel that takes about after resurrection. You would have thought that maybe it would have been important for Messiah himself, who after all, he's the one sitting at the right hand of the Father, who at least take it upon himself to tell everyone, hey guys, you know that temple over here? Do away with it. I resurrected it. It's all done away with it. Yeshua, for 40 straight days, never mentioned anything. In 40 days, you can do a lot of damage. One person can do damage in one teaching. Imagine how much you can do in 40 days. If you are the son of the living God and if you just resurrected, don't you think that he had the authority to say, hey, guys, no longer bring any sacrifices. Don't come to the temple. The law is abolished. And by the way, just let me go in into the Holy of Holies and do whatever I want in the temple now that I resurrected. Did Yeshua, does the Bible tell us that Yeshua went into the Holy of Holies after resurrection? Did he, did he go into the Holy of Holies before resurrection? Did he do the roles of the high priesthood before the resurrection and after? Did he tell the disciples to usurp the authority of the priesthood before and after resurrection? Why was Peter and John going up to the temple to pray at the hour of prayer? And the book of Acts talks about that after the resurrection. Why? If the law is done away with and the priesthood is a new one now, we got the Melchizedek priesthood. Mind you, the book of Hebrews was written approximately during the siege of Jerusalem, somewhere around the year 67 to 64 to 70. We're not quite sure exactly where. And it was written from Italy. 
So you mean to tell me that for 40 straight years, all these guys right here, all the disciples, were going to the temple, keeping the feast, like Paul was doing in Acts chapter 20, verse 16, where it clearly tells you that he was hastening to get, if possible, on time to Jerusalem for Pentecost. Why is he going to the temple for Pentecost? Why is it in Acts chapter 21, verse 17 to 35, he is bringing a Nazarite vow? If, in fact, that happened 20 years, 25 years after Yeshua died and resurrected. See, it's easy to apply something spiritually without any facts. But yet, there's not one verse in the New Testament. There's not one verse in the New Testament that is using the Melchizedek priesthood in reference to you and I. There's not one verse. First Peter is not talking to you if you're not part of Israel biologically. It's talking to the sons of Israel. Let's go there. We forgot to read the Bible, folks, and it's time to come back. Normally, I keep myself on the margin. I don't really say much. I just do my thing. But sometimes, certain teachings can bring a problem. One of the guys who created issues with this, we already know who he was. He actually tried to text me last night. He messaged me last night after like 14 years trying to convince me about the Melchizedek priesthood. Are you kidding me? There's not one verse. And you know what he says? He goes, I, I asked him, show me one verse. I got the audio. Show me one verse that says we are now a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he says, well, there isn't any. But if Yeshua is a high priest, isn't it logical that now we can be priests in the order of Melchizedek? What kind of evidence is that? What Bible are you reading? Yes, I'm going strong and I'm saying that. Okay? And so, therefore, when you go to 1 Peter, he's talking to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit. He's not talking to the Gentiles, folks. The word diaspora are the believers in Yeshua who were either Israelites in the dispersion. He is trying to encourage them, and it doesn't say Melchizedek in this text. It doesn't say Melchizedek in regards to you and I. The only reference to Melchizedek in the whole New Testament is in reference to Yeshua's role. And I believe that 100%. He did that in the heavenly tabernacle. There's no argument about that. But after Yeshua resurrected, he never mentioned a priesthood. Before he ascended, he never mentioned a priesthood. So why are we running wild saying that we are high priests in the order of Melchizedek when the Bible does not support that? By the way, I used to teach that 13 years ago, and I was wrong. I repented, I turned around, I began to research, I began to search, and I found that I was wrong. So today I'm going to show you how I found out that I was wrong. Are you ready for the readings? Everyone wants their spiritual application. I'd rather go back to the words of God because they matter. The Word of God and the commandments, they do matter. It gives us instructions. It gives us order. And right now, this whole thing is creating more issues. If you tell me Yeshua is the high priest in the Old Melchizedek, I will never disagree with you. Ever. But when you tell me that you are a high priest now, you can go into the Holy Holies, that does not, it's not supported in the Bible. Let me give you examples. You have Yeshua after the resurrection never mentioned anything. For 40 days, the disciples went up to the temple like I mentioned earlier. The book of Hebrews is in the context of Yom Kippur. But then, in order to become a priest, a high priest, or a priest, Aaron and his sons, you got to go to a rite of passage, you got to go to a ritual, anointment, ordination, consecration, laying of the hands, and a covenantal meal, and then bring a sacrifice. Let me repeat that again. The sons of Aaron went to an anointment. They were anointed, ordained, consecrated, they laid hands on him, on them, and they, they did a covenantal meal because they brought a sacrifice at the door of the tabernacle. Where is that anywhere in the New Testament in, re, in response to you and I? When were you ever anointed as a high priest? When were you ever anointed as a ordained as a high priest? When were you ever consecrated as a high priest? When were you ever laid hands as a high priest? When were you ever covenantal meal as a high priest? And Passover doesn't work because Passover is for the whole nation to remember the redemption. It's completely different. Next, we have what is called encroachment. The sons of Aaron, Adav and Abihu, 
they died and they were they were anointed, ordained, consecrated. They were they laid hands on them and they also ate the covenantal meal. But when they enter the areas that God says not to, uninvited, because it belonged to the Father, not to them, they died. King Uzziah, let's go there real quick. I want to give you the examples of what happens when people go into the temple and they're not the sons of Aaron. And God does not change. God is maintaining his integrity of his word and his decrees forever. And if you think you can go into the Holy of Holies and, you, and we teach that, we are committing huge problems. This can cause a lot of damage in the body of Messiah. Let me show you how. Now, let's go here to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles, chapter twenty-six, verses sixteen. You have King Uzziah. King Uzziah is enthroned, and now look to what he does. But on account of his strength, his heart grew proud unto destruction, and he acted on unfaithfully against the Lord his God. And went into the temple of the Lord to offer incense offering on the altar. That is considered, according to the Bible, unfaithfully. That is the word violates one's legal obligation. Treacherously. That's what the word means in Hebrew. Ma'al. He committed ma'al against God. If you're telling somebody that you're a high priest on the Oromo Melchizedek and you can go into the Holy Holies, you are doing exactly what Uzziah did. And it says... Let me read that again. And he acted unfaithfully against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to offer incense offering on the altar, the altar of incense. And Azariah the priest and 80 strong priests of the Lord with him went after him. And they stood against the king, Uzziah, and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the, incense to the Lord, but it is for the priests, the descendants of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn offering incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have acted unfaithfully. What is the word unfaithfully here? Ma'al. Ma'al. You want to continue to teach this message that everyone can go into the Holy Holies now? You are teaching them to commit transgression against God. Only Yeshua could go into the Holy Holies. In the heavenly tabernacle, but never Yeshua can go into the holy holies on the earth. Because we have a biblical precedent. Yeshua would have been king on the earth when he returns. And nowhere does it say he's going to go into the holy holies in the temple that will be standing in the millennial reign. This is biblical law. It seems like we don't really understand or we don't really read or we don't really believe the Bible anymore. We want to have a spiritual interpretations that is going to create chaos in this movement. It's already doing it in Arkansas. There are people being baptizing themselves into the Melchizedek priesthood. Where in the world do you see that in the Bible? There is not such a thing. Okay, so let's continue reading. And it says, they will, they will not honor for, uh, There will be no honor for you from the Lord your God. Then Uzziah... His censer in hand to burn incense became angry. And when he became angry with the priest, then leprosy appeared on his forehead in front of the priest in the house of the Lord at the altar of incense. When, Asa, when Azariah, the chief priest of all the priests, turned to him, behold, he was leprous in his forehead. So they rushed him away from there. And he also hastened to go out, for the Lord has smitten him. So let me get this straight. I don't get it. God is zealous to preserve his holiness. And he went into the holy place. He didn't even go into the holy holies. And God afflicted him with leprosy. You mean to tell me that now we can go into the holy holies? Seriously? We can't even go there physically. It's a spiritual application. Because on the day of atonement, the priest represented all of Israel. When Yeshua became a high priest in the heavenly tabernacle, is as if all of us enter through him, but we physically cannot go in. Only he could go in. That was the role of the high priest. Because the Holy of Holies represents the sacred space and the garden. What only life can preserve in the immortal. And that's why you have the incense to cover the flesh of Aaron. 
Aaron had to be perfect. He needed to be consecrated, ordained, anointed, selected for this job. If he didn't do the job correctly, he bear the guilt. That means that if Aaron was not worthy of going in or any of his sons into the Holy Holies, they bear responsibility and they would die on behalf of the people because they did the job wrong. So if you're not ordained, if you're not consecrated, if you're not anointed, then we have no business saying to anybody that we can go into the Holy Holies. That is not supported by Scripture. It's a spiritual application of the work of Yeshua when he interceded on our behalf. That now we can approach God in boldness, but that doesn't mean that we can go and sit down and just do whatever when God has never allowed in Scripture, never allowed anybody to approach him other than the sons of Aaron and only one of the sons of Aaron, the high priest. That's it. And he doesn't change. And in the book of Ezekiel says the same thing. We're going to read you the verses. I got a lot of verses. We're going to read them. And it says, When Azariah the chief priest and all the priests turned to him, behold, he was leprous in his forehead. So they rushed him away from there, and he also hastened to go out. For the Lord has smitten him. So King Uzziah was leprous until the day of his death. And he lived in a separate house as a leper. For he was cut off. From the house of the Lord. Cut off. Karetz. Because he was a king of Israel. And still God says. You do not belong here. Because he became arrogant. And he went in to do something. He was not authorized to do. This is important. King Saul. He basically lost his kingdom. Because he did a sacrifice. Unauthorized. Samuel told him. Then you have Korah, a classic case in the story of Korah. We're going to cover that in a minute. But this is just the introduction. I gave you the requirements for the high priest. So if you are a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, well, I want you to show me where did, when did you get anointed? When were you ordained? When were you consecrated according to the Bible protocols? When did they lay hands on you? And where is the covenantal meal? Because it has to be a sacrifice in the temple and you have to eat it at the door of the tabernacle like they did in the wilderness that basically anointed them forever. That's what gave them the right to, uh, to, um, to officiate throughout their history. That was a legal way that God did a rite of passage in order for everyone to know that these are the people that God chose. By the way, the fact that God still maintained the sons of Aaron does not mean... That the work of Yeshua is not valid. I don't understand where that comes from. I know. People get offended when I say it. If I ask you a question, what was the last time you spent actually studying the temple and its protocols and the 277, 279 laws that deals with the temple? Because the priesthood deals with the temple. The feast deals with the temple. Passover deals with the temple. The calendar deals with the temple. Well, that's another conversation. Let's continue on this. So we are going to read. I got all these verses. We're going to read them all. Because they told me that there's no biblical evidence. And I took offense to that. When they tell me there's no verses to support this, I'm actually asked the question, what are we reading in the Hebrew roots? Are we actually reading the Bible? Or are we going backwards? And this is, you know, this is, I'm being straightforward with you guys. I'm not trying to judge people. I'm just trying to present the facts. I want to give you the other side of the coin. And I don't want the coin, and I don't want to give you my own interpretation. We're going to go through the verses. Let me tell you what I'm going to do before we do it. We're going to go through the verses. We're going to look at the verses, read them, and then I'll give you definitions directly from the Hebrew into the English so you can see it. Are you ready for it? Okay. So let's go to the consecration of the priest in the book of Exodus, chapter 28. Let us let the word of God speak. In verse 1, and we're going to do a lot of reading. We're going to do a lot of reading. So, hey, you know, we're going to let the word of God, remember, by two or three witnesses, I'm still waiting for one verse that says in the New Testament that we are now high priests in the order of Melchizedek. I'm waiting for one verse that literally says, but I'm going to show you over 40 verses that says that the sons of Aaron, 40 or 30, I don't remember, that the sons of Aaron were chosen to be priests for God. And from that family, they can have the high priest. Let's read. Verse 20, chapter 28 of the book of Exodus. 
And bring near to you Aaron, your brother, and his sons with him from the midst of all of the Israelites to serve as priests for me. Aaron, Nadav, Abihu, Eliezer, and Itamar, the sons of Aaron. And you will make holy garments and, uh, for Aaron, and uh, your brother, for glory and for splendor. And you will speak to all the skill of heart who I have given the gift of skill. And they will make garments of Aaron to consecrate him. We need to look at that word. What is consecrate him here? To make him kadosh, holy, removed from common use. God is making the sons of Aaron, removing them from common use. They belong to God, to be holy, sacred. Remember, if you're calling yourself a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, you need to show me the evidence where God consecrated you for that. Okay? Biblically. And it says, The garments of Aaron to consecrate him for his serving as my priest. God's priest. And these are the garments that they will make. A breast, place, a breast piece, and an ephod, and a robe, and a tunic of speci uh, specially woven fabric. A turban and sash. They will make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and for his sons to serve as priests for me. Remember, the one who's speaking is God. Okay? Let me move on. I'm going to give you some more verses. It says, And Aaron will bear the name of the, the names of the Israelites in the breast piece of judgment of his heart when he comes to the sanctuary for remembrance before God continually. And you will put the Urim and the Thummim on the breast piece of judgment. And they will be on the heart of Aaron when he comes before the Lord. And Aaron will bear, watch this, and Aaron will bear the judgment of the Israelites on his heart before the Lord continually. Verse 33. And you will make on his hem pomegranates, blue and purple, crimson yarn, and his hem, uh, hem all around the belt of galls in the midst of them all around. Let me move on a little bit. Verse 36. Oh, wait a minute, verse 37. A gold belt and pomegranate, gold belts and a pomegranate on the hem of the robe all around, and it will be on Aaron for serving. And it sounds, and its sound will be heard at his coming into the sanctuary before the Lord, and at his going out, so he will not die. Now listen to what this happened. This is important. God is telling the high priest, if you're going to go into the holy place, we're not talking about the Holy of Holies because he cannot wear the priestly garments to go into the Holy of Holies. He had to wear the white linen garments on the Day of Atonement. He didn't have belts, belts at the end, okay? To go into the holy place, he had to wear that garment with the pomegranates and the bells because if he went in unannounced, he would die. So now we can go in and do whatever we want in the Holy of Holies and we don't have the authority, we don't have the consecration, the anointment, the laying of the hands, the covenantal is only with the sons of Aaron. Let's go back. And you will make a blue gold rosette, and you will engrave it on the seal engraving, holy object to the Lord. It's talking about the high priest. And you will place it on a blue cord, and it will be on the turban. At the front of the turban it will be. And it will be on the forehead of Aaron. And Aaron will bear the guilt. This is the responsibility. And this is what you're going to do if you tell them people you're high priest in the order of Melchizedek, then that person bears the responsibility of every wrong that you do. They bear the responsibility because they are encroaching against God. A high priest had the responsibility of the whole kingdom to bring them near correctly to the Lord. If you are usurping the authority of God's priesthood and saying that you are now a high priest in the order of Melchizedek and you're not anointed, then you, whatever you decide, whatever you say, whatever you teach, you are bearing the, the blood and you are now the responsible for whatever disobedience happens uh, to the things that are holy to God. Kedusha. Let's continue. He says, And it will be on the forehead of Aaron, and Aaron will bear the guilt of the holy objects that the Israelites will consecrate for all the holy gifts. And it will be on his forehead continually for acceptance before the Lord Adonai. Let's read. Verse 40 is very important. Verse 40. It says, And for the sons of Aaron, you will make for the sons of Aaron, not even for the Levites, but for the sons of Aaron. Okay? 
It says, you will make tunics and you will make for them sashes and headdresses. You will make them for glory and for splendor. And you will clothe them, Aaron, your brother, and his sons with them. And you will anoint them, ordain them, and consecrate them that they will serve as priests for me. Again, I ask the question. I want you to show me in the New Testament. Don't quote me First Peter. That's not talking about any anointment, any consecration, or any ordaining. I need to see the biblical verses in the New Testament that says that after Yeshua died and resurrected, he ordained, he anointed, and he consecrated the believers in Yeshua in order now to be the priest in the order of Melchizedek. I need to see that evidence. I've shown you the verses. I'm going to show you many, many more. But I'm showing you the verses. So what does the Bible say in the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 7? In the book of Acts, chapter 6, verse 7 says this, And the word of the Lord spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Does, do they stop doing their work because they believe in Yeshua? Or they continue to believe in Yeshua as they're doing their work in the temple? It doesn't say they quit. What, how come he didn't say, oh, by the way, you don't even have to be a priest anymore because now everyone else is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. We have to, it's what it says. They believed in Yeshua. They, it doesn't say they quit. That would have been a perfect opportunity to say, okay, we quit. Sacrificial thing, over. Priesthood over. Nowhere does it say that. On the contrary, it supports that the sons of Aaron will forever be. So let's continue to read. I'm going to give you more evidence. Let's go quickly. Let's continue reading here. I got too many verses, and I hope people stick around. If not, I'm still going to record it. I want to be on record where I stand. I want to be on record where I stand in regards to these things. Too many people give an interpretation, and they're not showing you the evidence. I'm showing you evidence. We need to defend the holy things of God. Whatever God says is holy, we need to defend it. We have to stop reinventing the wheel. If you tell me that Yeshua did the role of the high priesthood, I agree. In the heavenly tabernacle, not a problem. But there's no evidence anywhere that we are high priests in the order of Melchizedek. It doesn't say that anywhere. Okay? And it says, and uh, it says this. Let me read that again. Verse 41. And you will clothe them, Aaron, and you, uh, your brother and his sons with them. And you will anoint them and ordain them and consecrate them. And they will serve as priests for God. For me, he's the one talking. And make for them undergarments of linen to cover their naked flesh. And they will be from the loins to, uh, to thigh. And they will be on Aaron and his sons. When they come to the tent of assembly, or when they approach the altar to serve in the sanctuary, so that they will not bear the guilt and die. It is a lasting statue for him and his offsprings after him. Guys, lasting. The word statues here in the Hebrew is chukah. Statue, do, established, defined. It's a law. It's an ordinance. No one can change it. We need to learn biblical terms. Let's go to chapter 29. And this is the thing that you will do for them to consecrate them, to serve as priests for me. How many times have you seen when God says, they are priests for me? Yeshua can now usurp the authority of the Father. And it says, take a young bull, two rams without defect, and unleavened bread, and unleavened, uh, and unleavened ring-shaped bread cakes mixed with oil, wafers, and unleavened bread smeared with oil. You will make them with fine milk wheat flour. And you will put them on one basket and you will bring them on the basket and bring the bull and two rams. And you will bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of assembly. And you will wash them with water. This is the ritual that no one in the New Testament has gone through to proclaim themselves high priests or priests for that matter. Now remember, Exodus 19 says, you will be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They worship the golden calf, and then God says in Numbers chapter 3 that he has taken the firstborn of Israel and redeemed them and gave it to the priesthood. We're going to read that in a little bit. Now what we see here in this verse is are the rite of passage. 
that they need to go through in order for legally for them to be able to approach the altar. They needed to be anointed, ordained, consecrated. Now the consecration process begins. So if you are a high priest in the Old Melchizedek, where is your consecration ritual? Where is it? You're not going to find it anywhere. Okay, so let's continue. And you will bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of assembly, and you will wash them with water. And you will take the garment and clothe Aaron with the tunic and the robe on the ephod, and you will fasten to him the ephod and the breast place, breast piece, I'm sorry, with the waistband of a ephod. And you will set the turban on his head, and you will put the holy diadem on his turban. Remember, the diadem says, Kadosh la Adonai. So they're being separated. And you will take the anointing oil. Now comes the anointing. We have the consecration. Now you got the anointing. And pour it on his head and anoint him. And you will bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. And you will gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and headdresses on them. And priesthood will be theirs as a lasting rule. What is the rule here? Again, the word chuka. It's a chuka. It's a statue. No one can change it. Not even Yeshua can change it. And this is the reason why Yeshua never mentioned it. You know why? Because he actually read the Torah. Our Messiah st stood by the law. Because the law is legal. The Torah is legal binding. It has laws in it. It's a treaty that has laws. That's why Yeshua never spoke against it. He spoke against the corruption the behavior that was not conducive of their responsibility, but he never challenged their authority in regards to their jobs because God ordained it as a chukah. And Yeshua understood as a good Jew that he is that he can never challenge the decrees of the great king. He can never do that. If we will study the temple, we will know this. And I, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm not trying to be mean. But when people just tell me things spiritually, just grabbing things from the air, and then I hear somebody telling me that there's no evidence of this being in the Bible, I'm wondering, what have we been doing for the last 25 years in this movement? It's not enough that Yeshua is a high priest. Now we also want to do that too? When nowhere, even Hebrews chapter 8 verse 4. Let's go read it. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 4. What does it say? Let me read from verse 4, from verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary for this one, Yeshua, also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests to offer according to the law. So let me get this straight. Even the writer of Hebrews tells you that if Yeshua was on earth, he cannot be a priest. Because they were priests according to the law, but now Yeshua becomes a high priest on the heavenly tabernacle, which I agree. And now we are all priests on the earth. So I don't get it. Yeshua could not be a priest. And he's Jewish. Okay? And people from the nations come in with no affiliation from biologically with Israel or the sons of Aaron. Or even Israel, or for all that matter. We've been grafted in. So Yeshua on the earth, he cannot be a priest. But now you can a high priest or a priest when God already ordained the sons of Aaron? Is that making sense? I mean, we are basically twisting the word. And the worst thing is, we say we follow Torah. This is what we used to do in the systems of religion that we came from. We have lost our way. We have lost our way. If this was a spiritual application, we would have 300 people here. But God forbid we're reading the Bible. You know, now we got to be confronted with what the Bible says, Scripture. And people will have all kinds of arguments. That's why we need to read. We will see if people want to respect what God says. We already have a legal precedent. King Uzziah, a king of Israel, he was hit with leprosy when he tried to do the incense service in the holy place. King Saul, a king of Israel, he tried to offer a sacrifice. He was not authorized. And because he did it, Samuel told him, you lost the kingdom. Right? Korah, who was a Levite. He was some of the sons of the Levites. He tried to usurp the authority of Moses and Aaron, and he died and the people with him. And these are part of Israel. Literally, biologically, they were part of Israel. How much more will happen to us when the Bible calls us strangers? The word czar. A stranger shall not approach the altar. I will show you that in a minute. 
Let's continue. It says, and you will gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and wrap headdresses on them. And priesthood will be theirs as a lasting rule. And you will ordain Aaron and his sons. Where's our ordination? Can anybody please point a verse in the New Testament where it says that we have been ordained as high priests to officiate where? There's no temple. So are we the temple or are we the priests? Which one are we? I mean, I don't understand. I, I understand that Paul, Paul says in Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, aren't you the temple of God? He's talking to the community. He's not talking to the individual. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 through 5, you see it. He's talking to the ecclesia. And he's dealing with moral behavior. He is saying, you cannot meet me sacrifice to idols. You cannot worship other gods. You cannot commit sexual sin. Don't you know that you're the temple of God? How would the Lord teach you how to live in holiness if you do not study the physical temple to teach you how we are to live? That's why we are not to eat pork, because pork was never allowed on the altar of God. It would defile it. Using the temple as a guide to teach us what holiness and what we as a body supposed to be a temple for the presence of God. For the, I'm sorry, for the, for the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Can the Holy Spirit dwell in a defiled temple? Ask yourself that question. Is there any verses in the New Testament? I'm, I'm going to wait for the verses. I need to see if there are verses in the New Testament that tells you that anyone who believes in Yeshua now, they will be ordained, anointed, and consecrated as high priests, as some people are saying. And that we can go into the Holy Holies. Where does it say that in the Bible? Please give me verses. I need minimum one. and Just give me one. Just one verse. First Peter is to the ten tribes of Israel. First Corinthians is talking to the Corinthians in regards to their immoral behavior. Read the whole book. It tells you. As a matter of fact, Paul is using the Torah portion, Kedoshim, to teach First Corinthians. He's quoting commandments from the parasha for the Torah portion, Kedoshim. Almost 16 commandments he's quoting in the book of First Corinthians, in the letter to the Corinthians. First letter. Let's continue reading. Now, and you will bring the bull before the tent of meeting, and Aaron and his sons will lay their hands on the head of the bull, and you will slaughter a bull before the Lord at the entrance in the tent of meeting. And you will take some of the blood of the bull, and with your finger, put it on the horns of the altar. And you will pour, you will pour out all the blood at the base of the altar. Can you be anointed as a high priest right now without an altar? No, that already happened with the sons of Aaron in the wilderness once and for all. And you will take and turn into smoke on the altar all the fat covering any part, any parts, and the loaf on the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, and the flesh of the bull and the skins, and it's all for you will burn with fire outside the camp as a sin offering. The word sin offering is chatat, is purification. Now, I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to read a little. Fall. There we go, right here. Verse 21 forward says, And you will take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil, and you will spat it on Aaron, on his garments and on his sons, and on his sons' garments with them. And he will be sacred. He will be. Aaron will be sacred and his sons sacred, set aside, holy to God. Right? That's what I mean, sacred. And his garments and his sons and his sons' garments with them. And you will take from the ram and the fat, and the fat tail, and the fat covering on the inner parts, and the lobe of the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, and the right thigh, because it is the ram of ordination. What is the, the word there, ordination in the Hebrew? Consecration. It's a consecration. It's a, this is part of the priestly ordination service. Come on, guys. Where is the consecration? For the believers in Yeshua as high priests of Melchizedek. I need to know. I don't see it anywhere. I may be wrong, and I don't mean to I don't mean to be sarcastic. It's such a big deal, but yet I don't know where the evidence is from. From verses that is not referring to directly to the Gentiles coming in that are grafted in. I understand if God says, Hey, you'll be a nation of priests in first Peter, because he's talking to the dispersed one, this person, the ten tribes of Israel and Asia Minor. 
Paul was talking to the Gentiles in Galatians. But there's not the consecration. There's not the anointment. There's not the laying of the hands. Let's continue reading. It gets better. It says, One loaf of bread and one ring-shaped baked cake of oil of bread and one wafer and basket of unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you will put them on, on the palm of Aaron and on the palms of his sons and you will wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Now they are waved to the Lord. And you will take them from their hand and turn them to smoke on the altar besides the burnt offering. As a fragrance of appeasement before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire before God. Now watch this. Verse 26. And you will take the breast section of the ram of ornation that is for Aaron, and you will wave it as a wave offering before the Lord. It will be your portion. And you will consecrate the wave offering breast section, and the thigh to the contribution was waved, and that was presented from the ram of ordination that is for Aaron and his sons. And it will be for Aaron and his sons as a lasting rule. Again, the word rule, chuka, a chok, which is the same one as chuka, a law. You calling yourself a high priest in the Lord Melchizedek, you are now transgressing a chuka, a decree from God, with no evidence, with no, there's not that evidence anywhere in the New Testament that says that you and I are priests in the Lord Melchizedek. In that language, nowhere to be found. But yet, you find verses and verses and verses that says that Aaron and his sons were ordained, anointed, consecrated for their jobs in the temple on the earth. Even Yeshua cannot be a priest on the earth, but we can. In the order of Melchizedek, when Yeshua never mentioned anything. No evidence in the New Testament, but now that's taking hold. Because we don't want to be like Israel. We don't want to submit to Israel. We don't want to respect the temple. We don't want to respect its laws. We don't want to respect his priesthood. We don't want to respect his, uh, the duties of it and the holiness of it. Let's continue reading. Verse 31. Oh, wait a minute. And the holy garments that are for, verse 29, and the holy garments that are for Aaron will be on his sons after him, in which to anoint them and to ordain them. Seven days, the priest who, replace, who replaces him from among his sons will wear them, who comes to the tent of assembly to serve in the sanctuary. And you will take the ram of ordination and boil his meat in a holy place. And Aaron and his sons will eat the meat of the ram and the breast that is in the basket at the entrance of the tent of assembly. And they will eat them. The things on which atonement was made for them to ordain, to consecrate them. And a stranger, this is the key here. I was waiting to get here. And a stranger will not eat them because they are holy objects. In other words, what does the word stranger mean here? The Hebrew word is czar. And the word czar means strange, different, illicit, unauthorized, non-Israelite, prohibited. If you're not a son of Aaron, you eat, even the a Levite could not touch the altar. A Levite could not touch the sacrifices to put them on the altar. This is a Levite. Only the sons of Aaron can do that. And the Bible tells us in Numbers 18 that if they allowed the sons of Aaron, if they allowed anyone else to touch the altar... Not only did the sons of Aaron will die, but also the person who touched the altar. That's the reason why the 80 strong priests were willing to kick the king of Israel, Uzziah, outside. Get out. It's not for you. These are priests kicking the king of Israel outside of the temple. But now we can go in because Yeshua did the work of the high priesthood in the heavenly tabernacle. Now you and I can be high priests. That's not supported anywhere in the Bible. It's not. If it is, please show it to me because I, I am willing to change my position if you give me the overwhelming evidence. We have to make this like a legal case, not a theological argument. I'm giving you verses. I'm giving you legal terms, consecration, ordination, and it tells you even if you're a stranger, if you're Ill, uh, uh, unsolicited, illicit, you're not authorized. Let's continue here. Verse 43 in chapter 29. It says, and I will meet with the Israelites there in the tabernacle, and it will be and, I, and it will be consecrated for my glory, and I will and I will consecrate the tent 
of assembly and the altar and Aaron and his sons, and I will consecrate to serve as priests for me. And I will be in the dwell, and, and I will dwell in the midst of the Israelites, and I will be their God. And they will know that I am the Lord their God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt in order to dwell in their midst. I am the Lord their God. Guys, the one who spoke here is God. Are you going to listen to God, or are you going to listen to anybody else tell you something that is not validated by the Bible? It's come to a decision making. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But I'm not going to be running after people coming up with things that is not in Scripture. We need to draw a line in the sand and say, no, this is what the Bible says. We're going to believe what God says. If Yeshua comes back and he says, guys, didn't you know? You will, uh, high priest and the order of Melchizedek and say, well, I didn't see the verses. The Bible says by the evidence of two or three witnesses, no one told me except some people from the nations who come in and now everybody's a high priest. So that's what we learn in the, in the church system. We continue on the same thing. So let the Bible speak. Let's go back to the Word. All right. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1. We got a lot of verses still. Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1 through verse 7. Then Adonai spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. Speak to the Israelites, saying, If a person sins by an unintentional wrong from any of the Lord's command that we should be violated, and he violates any of them, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, then concerning the sin that he has committed, he shall bring a young bull without defect for the Lord as a sin offering. He shall... He shall bring a bull to the tent of meeting, uh, to the tent of assembly entrance before the Lord. Place his hand on the bull and slaughter the bull before the Lord. The anointed priest shall take some of the bull, uh, uh, the bull's blood and shall bring it to the tent of meeting. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and shall spatter some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the sanctuary curtain. That's in front of the altar of incense. The priest shall put some of the blood on the horn of the altar of fragrant incense before the Lord, which is in the tent of meeting, and all the rest of the bull's blood he must pour out at the base of the altar of burnt offering, which has it on the entrance of. So it tells you it's the priests who are anointed. The Bible is quite clear on this. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 6, verse 8. It says, then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the regulation of the burnt offering. The burnt offering must remain on the hearth, on the altar, all night until morning, and the altar's fire must be kept burning on it. And the priest shall put on linen robe, and he must put his linen undergarments of his body, and shall take away the fatty ashes um, and the burnt offering, so the fire consume on the... I mean, it's quite clear it is the sons of Aaron. Okay? Talking about how to do with the altar. Let's go to verse 24 and 27. 24 to 27 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the regulation of the sin offering. In the place where the sin offering is slaughtered, the sin offering must be slaughtered before the Lord. It is most holy. The priests who offer the sin offering must eat it in a holy place. It's quite interesting. So a question that always arises is, but when I recall about the, about the firstborn, aren't we the firstborn? Aren't we priests? Well, let's see what the Bible says. Let's read Numbers chapter 3. These are the genealogies of Aaron and Moses at the, at the time when the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. These are the names of the descendants of Aaron. Nadav and Abihu. Nadav the firstborn, Abihu, Eliezer and Itamar. These are the names of the descendants of Aaron. The priests, the anointed ones who he consecrated priests. The word consecrated here says, The verb consecrate means to induct a person into a sacred office by means of a religious rite or declare a thing or object to be sacred. The noun consecration indicates an act by which a person or thing is set apart to sacred cause or, prep or purpose. So my question is, my question is, where is the ritual that ordained all these people to be high priests in the order of Melchizedek? 
it's not an immersion. There are people right now that are being baptized into the Melchizedek order. You don't find that anywhere in the Bible. That is an invention. We are just changing the things that God ordained. Now we're in trouble. We are encroaching again. We are full circle back to Korah. And we can validate with the Bible. Again, we're not touching about Yeshua as a high priest. That's already already established. We're not talking about that. Uh, please follow me. Yeshua is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Got it. He did that work. Amen. I'm 100% in charge of that. I got it. I'm with you. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people being in the order of Melchizedek. Priests. High priests. Not such a thing. Let's continue here. These are the names of the descendants of Aaron and the priests, the anointed ones, who he consecrated as priests. God consecrated as priests. To many people, that doesn't mean anything anymore. It's worse. They're saying that Yeshua probably did it now. Slander, because Yeshua never said that. Nadab and Abihu died before the Lord when they presented strange fire. Now, let's look at the word strange here. See what it says. I just, I'm curious. Czar. Interesting. Illicit, unauthorized. That's what the word czar means, uh, uh, unauthorized fire. Wait, wait, let me get this straight. These are the sons of Aaron that were anointed, ordained, consecrated. They did the rite of passage to eat at the door of the temple, of the tabernacle. They were there and the people laid hands on them. And they died because they went in unannounced, unsolicited, illicit. It was not, they were considered strangers. Strange fire. And these were the people called to be priests. But God says there's an order. Aaron is the one who can come in. Not just you guys. Now if that happened to Adav and Nadav and Abihu. Who were anointed, consecrated, dedicated. And they died. What do you think is going to happen to us if we continue to say. That we are now under a priesthood that the Bible does not support. That is encroachment. Yes, I'm not holding back. This is based on the studies because I made this mistake like 15 years ago. And I had to go back and research and study and educate myself and validate. And I don't have a problem not being a high priest with nothing. I'm happy being a servant of God, upholding God's word and believing in what he says, that he ordained and he set it set aside and consecrated the people for his service. Let's continue reading. It says, in, uh, it says, uh, when they present a strange fire before the Lord in the desert of Sinai, and they had no children, Eliezer and Itamar served as priests during the presence of Aaron, their father. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring near the tribe of Levi and set the tribe before Aaron, the priest. And they will minister to him. They shall observe his duties and the duties of the entire community before the tent of meeting to do the work of the tabernacle. And they will keep all the vessels of the tent of assembly and the responsibilities of the Israelites to do the work of the tabernacle. You will give, it's a gift, Natan the Levites to Aaron and to his descendants, they are surely assigned to him from among the Israelites. God already said that. The Levites are the one who helped the sons of Aaron, not the Israelites. This is the order and the hierarchy of order in the kingdom. God says, Aaron, his sons, family, the Levites will help them with logistics, administration, making their job easier. And then Israel, uh, stay over there because you worship the golden calf. And you no longer have the right to approach God in the temple. God chose his order and we cannot take it away. Please don't go there. Please don't do that. Don't go there. Don't try now to usurp and take away what God has ordained holy. Because that will cause chaos for everybody. Okay? And I show you that. In, I'm going to show you that in a minute. In the book of Numbers 16. We're going to get there. Okay? Hope you stay with me. It says, And they shall keep all the vessels of the tent of assembly and the responsibilities of the Israelites to do the work of the tabernacle. You will give the Levites to Aaron and to his descendants. They are surely assigned to him from among the Israelites. But you will count Aaron and his descendants, and they will keep their priesthood. And the stranger who approaches will be put to death. Approaches. The most important function of the Levites 
uh, uh, of the Levites, one that invests their entire adult life, is to guard the sanctuary against encroachers. In fact, they are identified by this function, guardians of the tabernacle of the Lord. In, um, in chapter 31, verse 30 and verse 41, 47. In the ancient world, the entrance of temples were adorned with images of protectors, uh, protector gods to ward off super, uh, supernal demons. In the Bible, are the Levites protecting and the priests protecting the sacred space. So it says, an outsider who approaches will put to death. An outsider, again, a stranger, is the word czar. Illicit, unauthorized, non-Israelite. Are we biological Israel? If you're grafted in, you are considered a stranger who are grafted in. Okay? You cannot approach God unless he says those can approach. I'm talking about the priesthood. We can approach God now. We can pray. We can pray to God. We have access through Yeshua to talk and to go directly to Him in a protocol. We have that. No one argues that. But what is next? People sacrificing their own lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost like the priesthood, uh, like the uh, Melchizedek priesthood is doing now? Not all of them. I'm not saying all of them. But there are branches within the Melchizedek priesthood who are slaughtering their own lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost. Don't you know that manipulating the blood only belongs to the sons of Aaron? Not even a Levite could do that. And <laughs> we're playing with fire, folks. We need to go back to basics and really understand the Bible. Because we're playing with fire. And I did not understood this for a long time. Until I got together with my teacher, Joseph Good, and I began to understand biblical law and the protocol of the temple, and it scared the living daylights out of me, and I repented. I turned around, and I told the Lord, please forgive me, because I, I was doing something. I did not know how, how significant of a mistake I was making. I am willing to do that. I will change. If I teach something wrong, I will do it. I don't have a problem doing that, because ultimately, it's all about honoring the Lord, about being His servant. But we need to return and obey what it says. Let us stop reinventing the wheel. We are now at the time of the judges. Everyone doing according to the imagination of their own hearts. There are people who don't talk to me because I don't follow their calendars. I don't pronounce the names the way they pronounce it. I don't believe that they're that, that I'm Melchizedek high priest, so they don't talk to me anymore. They slander, they talk, they do this. Let the evidence of the Bible stand. Who is right, the Bible or uh, or you? Because the last time I checked. God is the king who sent his son to reach you in the nations, to bring you from slavery to death, to bring you from, from, from a lost hope of nothing. We have nothing. And the Lord sent his son to restore Israel and to give you the good news, to forgive and to give you remission from eternal damnation. And now you're going to come in into God's kingdom and you're going to take away what God has ordained, consecrated, and set aside as holy for him? That is encroachment. And I will stand as a witness that we are doing that. And we have to stop. Leaders lead. It's not about being famous. It's not about being popular. It's about defending the integrity of the holy things of God. And it's already time for us to start behaving like a kingdom who, the, who really can honor God by our obedience. Not changing the holy things. Let us continue. The Lord, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I myself received the Levites from the midst of the Israelites in the place of all the firstborn of the offspring of the womb from the Israelites. The Levites will be mine because all the firstborn are mine. On the day my killing of all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated for myself all the firstborn of Israel, both human and animal, they will be mine on the Lord. But he took the Levites from among them, the Israelites, and he redeemed them. That's why you have the redemption of the firstborn, folks. When you go to verse 27, all the way through to the latter part of, ver of this chapter 3, now it says this, And the Lord said to Moses, Muster every firstborn male from the Israelites, from one month and above, and count their names, and you will receive the Levites for me. Guys, the Levites belong to God. You want to fight that battle? Are you sure you want to go declare war on God? Telling them that the Levites are done away with? 
that the Levitical priesthood is no longer valid? Are you sure you want to fight that battle? Because Korah lost, King Uzziah received leprosy, and King Saul lost the kingdom. I mean, Nadab and Abihu tried to usurp the authority of their father, and they died. I mean, are you sure you want to battle against God? Because it's a decree. And we are all strangers who by grace came into the covenant. And now we, by grace, are partakers of the kingdom of God. But that's not enough. Now we want to take away what, what, what God said is holy. That's not enough anymore. Now you want the priesthood too? Let's continue. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Receive the Levites in the place of all the firstborn of the Israelites, and the animals and the, of the Levites in place of their animals. The Levites will be mine. I am the Lord. And the ransom of the 273 of the firstborn of the Israelites, who are excessive over the Levites, you will receive five shekels of a person in the sanctuary shekel. You will collect 20 gerar per shekel, and you will give the money to Aaron. And to his sons, the ransom of the ones who are excessive among them. And Moses received the money of the redemption from the ones who were excessive from the redeemed of the Levites. From the firstborn of the Israelites, he took the money, 1,365 shekels in the shekel, at uh, the sanctuary shekel. And Moses gave the money of the ransom to Aaron, to his sons, according to the word of the Lord, just as the Lord commanded Moses. Let's go to Numbers chapter 16. They told me there's no biblical evidence. I'm showing you the biblical evidence. I was basically told in a post. There's no biblical verses supporting the Levitical priesthood. When I read that, I'm going like, are you kidding me? So because I am called to lead, I'm leading. So I'm showing you the evidence. Okay? But I'm expecting somebody to actually write down on Facebook to give me at least minimum two verses of one where Yeshua, Peter, John, James, Paul, any of them said, hey guys, we are high priesthood in the Old Melchizedek now. I'm going to be waiting for the verses. Please provide it. Because I'm providing many, many verses already. And I'm going to show you more. Because we have to. See, the preponderance of evidence establishes a case. It's not about spiritual application. It's about law. And when you talk about the priesthood, it's law. When you talk about the high priest, it's law. Because God consecrated them. He dedicated, uh, he uh, anointed them, consecrated them, ordained them, and did a covenantal meal at the tabernacle of meeting. Okay? And don't use Passover as that. That's not a requirement for the priesthood. Okay? Because then every Israelite right now will be a priest when Numbers 3 already tells you that God redeemed the firstborn of Israel to give it to the Levites? All right, let's talk about Korah. Let's see what great idea Korah had. And let's let, let the evidence stand for itself. Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohat, the son of Levi, and Datam and Avion, son of Eliab, and On, son of Peleg, the descendants of Reuben. Interesting. This guy, Korah, is actually a Levite. He set aside for God already to help the priests. Took 250 men from the Israelites, leaders of the community, summoned from the assembly, renowned men. And they confronted Moses. Wait a minute, Moses was called to do that work. And they assembled in front of, the, in front of Moses and Aaron. And they said to them, you take too much upon yourself. All the community is holy, which is true, but not holy to do the priesthood. Every one of them, and the Lord is in their midst. So why do you raise yourself above the assembly of the Lord? When Moses heard this, he fell to his face, on his face. And he said to Korah and to the entire company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will make the Lord will make known who is and who is holy, who is his and who is holy, and he will bring him near to him. Whomever he chooses, he will bring near near to him. Do this. Take for yourself censors. Korah and all the company tomorrow put fire on them and place incense on them before the Lord. The men whom God chooses will be holy, the Holy One. You take too much upon yourself, sons of Levi. Moses is telling them, 
you are encroaching, Levi. And this is a family qu a squabble. This is, this is Moses arguing with his own family. Because if it would have been a stranger or a Gentile, the guy would have died on the spot. Because they're not supposed to even come near. Israelites came in, the sons of uh, Reuben. Why? It's, it's interesting. You're going to go talk to the people who are, you know, who are wounded because they were the firstborn. Reuben was the firstborn. He never got the firstborn blessing. Joseph had it. So it's a family squabble, a dysfunctional family. Let's continue. And Moses said to Korah, please listen, sons of Levi. It is too little for you that the God of Israel set you apart from the community of Israel to allow you to approach him. And to do work of the tabernacle of the Lord. To stand before the community to serve them. He has allowed you to approach him. And you with all your brothers. The descendants of Levi. But yet you also seek the priesthood. Therefore you and your company. Have band together against God. What is Aaron. That you grumble against him. Sin, sinning against God. Let me see what the word grumble here means. Murmur. Okay. So they slander. So anytime you say, oh, God did away with the Levitical, uh, Levitical, the whole priesthood is no longer valid, uh, you're doing exactly what Korah did. We, we're letting the Bible talk. And the Bible is actually giving us exactly what happens when people mess around with his holy things, with God's holy things. Please, I beg of you, don't do that. Let us not mess around with the holy things of God. I did it for years not knowing. And by the mercy of the Lord, I'm here because he's grateful. He's graceful. He's merciful. He knew my heart was willing to learn. But I cannot believe the stuff I was teaching like 17 years ago because I didn't have all the information. I'm trying to give you all the information. It's a lot of new people coming in. A lot of impressionable people coming in. Learn to believe what God says. We continue reading. Okay? Moses sent to call for Dathan and Aviram, the son of Eliab, but they said, we will not come. Is it, too little that, is it too little that you have brought us from the land of the, that flows milk and honey and to kill us in the desert? Now let me go to verse 15. Then Moses became angry. He said to the Lord, do not notice their grain offering. I have not offered one donkey from them. I have not offered one, uh, one donkey from them. I have not mistreated one of them. So Moses said to Korah, you and your entire company will, will be before the Lord tomorrow. You and they and Aaron. And one, each one, take his censer and put censer on her. You were presented before the Lord, and each of you bring his censer. 250 censers, you and Aaron, each his censer. So each of them took his censer, and they put fire on them, and they placed incense on them. And they stood at the door of the tent of assembly of Moses, of the tent of assembly of Moses and Aaron. And Korah summoned them, the entire community, by the door of the tent of assembly. And the glory of the Lord appeared to all the community. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from the midst of this community, that I can destroy them in a moment. Hmm. Are you sure you want to be a high priest on the Lord Melchizedek? Please reconsider. And they fell on their faces and said, God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, will one man sin and you become angry towards the entire community? The Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the community saying, move away from the dwelling of Korah, Dathan and Aviram. So Moses stood and went, went to Dathan and Aviram. The elders of Israel followed after him. He said to the community saying, please turn away from the tent of this wicked man. Wait a minute. They're considered wicked because they challenge Aaron? Guilty, wicked person, unrighteous, we're letting the Bible speak, and do not touch anything that belongs to them, and you will be destroyed with their sins. So they moved the wave around from the dwellings of Korah, Dathan, and Aviram, and Dathan and Aviram came out, standing at the door of their tents, with their wives, sons, and their little children. And Moses says, if this is, if this is your will, if this, in this, you will know that the Lord has sent me to do all this work, it is not from my heart. If they die a natural, death, a natural death, and you know the story, the, 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 the whole thing opened up. The whole earth opened and it swallowed them alive. And it happened soon after he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open. We already got that. But they never learned the lesson. Let's read verse 36. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Say to Eliezer, son of Aaron, the priest, 
take out the censer from among the place of burning because they are sacred and scatter the fire outside the censer of these who have sinned at the cost of their lives and let them be made into good old living plating at the altar. I want you to pay attention to what it says. It says, because they presented them before the Lord, they are holy, the plates, and they will be a sign for the Israelites. Eliezer and the priest took the bronze censers that the ones who were burned presented, and they hammered them out thinly and plating for the altar. It was a memorial for the Israelites, so that no strange man, God calls them, and they're Israelites, czar again. No unsolicited, unauthorized, illicit person. And these were a Levites and the sons of Reuben. They were considered strange. Who is not from the offspring. Let me read this again. It was a memorial for the Israelites. So that no czar, a stranger, man who was not from this offspring of Aaron, should approach the presence of, God, of the Lord to, to burn smoke offering. He will not. He will not be like Korah and his company as the Lord has spoken to him by the hand of Moses. So what does the people do? The people are freaking out. So the people now are saying to the Lord, what are we going to do? If we approach you, we're going to die? So God says, I got your back. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to make sure that you're safe. I know I'm taking a long time quoting you a lot of verses. But it's interesting when somebody, you know, teaches you about this stuff. People run wild and they, it's a conversation on Facebook. We letting the Bible speak. I think it's time for, for us to hear what God says. We're hearing everybody else. Everybody has an opinion. I think it's time for the Lord to speak through his word. Let's see what he says. Let's see what God has to say about when people mess around with the holy things. Do we have access to the heavenly tabernacle? No. Only Yeshua did. Do the Levites and the priests can officiate in the heavenly tabernacle? No. They don't have legal jurisdiction. Can Yeshua have legal jurisdiction to officiate as a priest on the earth? No. It's given to the sons of Aaron. Yeshua, when he returns, he will be a king. He can't go into the Holy Holies. So if Yeshua himself cannot go into the Holy Holies, why? He's from the tribe of Judah. And we already know that a king of Israel already tried that and he, he got leprosy. What makes you think you and I can? Are we going to go against the evidence that we have? What God says? No stranger, if you're not ordained, consecrated, if you're not dedicated to the Lord, you consider strange. If you're not a son of Aaron, it tells you right here. Let's continue. The next day, all the community and the Israelites grumble against Moses and Aaron. They didn't learn their lesson. They keep challenging. You have killed the people of the Lord. Then when the community had gathered against Moses and Aaron, they turned to the tent of assembly and said, Behold, the cloud covered it. The glory of the Lord appeared. And Moses and Aaron came to the front of the tent of meeting. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Get away from the midst of this community. I will finish them at an instant. Because they challenge. Because the Israelites, Israelites challenge God's authority when they turn against his appointed people. Let me repeat that again. Because God wanted to destroy the Israelites. Biological sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because they turn against God's authority of the people that he selected, that he anointed, that he ordained, that he consecrated. And everyone made a covenant with God saying, these are the people. And God says, get away from these guys. Let's get rid of them. Hmm. Let's continue. And Moses and Aaron said, Take the censer and put on the fire on the altar. Place the incense on it and bring it quickly to the community and make atonement for them because their wrath went out to separate uh, from the presence of the Lord and a plague has begun. So Aaron took it just, he took it just as Moses had spoken and he ran in the midst of the assembly and he stopped. He stopped the plague. 14,700 people died because they challenged on account of Korah. Because Korah wanted the priesthood. Because Korah enticed the community to turn against God by challenging the authority of Aaron and his sons. Does that sound familiar? Isn't that what's happening right now? This is the reason why I have to do this, guys. It's the reason why I have to speak about this. So many people are going to have their debates. They're going to have all the arguments. They're not, they're not going to agree with me because maybe they don't like me. It's okay. 
But I'm just reading verses. Just remember that you're arguing against the word. We're going back to the word. We're letting the word stand for what it is. It's truth. If God is God, then we have to respect his decrees and his laws. Remember, Yeshua never said anything about Melchizedek priesthood. Okay? Peter never said anything. James never said anything. John never said anything about Melchizedek priesthood. It's mentioned in the book of Hebrews in regards to Yeshua. And we don't even know who wrote the book. For now you're going to go running wild saying that the Levitical uh, system and the temple is no longer valid. And if they build the temple, it's not of God. Let's continue. And it says, Then Aaron turned to Moses at the door of the tent of meeting, and the plague was stopped. It's overkill. I'm giving you too many verses. I know. I have to do it. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the Israelites and take them from among the twelve staffs. Now you have twelve staffs. I'm going to go to verse 4. And you must put them on the tent of meeting before the testimony where I meet you. And it will happen. The men whom I will choose, his staff will blossom. And I will, and I will rid from among myself the grumbling of the Israelites who are grumbling against you. Moses spoke to the Israelites. And all the leaders gave him a staff from each leader. One from each of their tribes and the families. Twelve, ta uh, twelve staffs and the staff of Aaron was in the midst of their tribes. Now let me move on. And the one from Moses and from Aaron blossomed uh, 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 almond buds. We got it. You already know the story. And it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Bring back the staff of Aaron before the testimony. Pay attention now. As a guard and sign for the children of rebellion. And let them finish the grumbling before me and not die. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him, so he did. Let me read this verse again. When the staff, when the staff came, uh, the blossoms in the, uh, for Aaron and his sons, for Aaron, God says, and the Lord said to Moses, bring back the staff of Aaron before the testimony. Brought it into the Holy Holies as a guard and sign for the children of rebellion and let them finish their grumbling before me and not die. It's considered rebellion. What is the word rebellion here? Let's look it up. Contentiousness. Contentiousness. Rebellious. When you look in different, it says rebellious, rebel, bitter. It's rebellion when we go against God's commandments. Is that what we want? Is that where we're at right now? Is that how far we've come? That now we have to rebel against God? Is that how far we've come? I want, I'm asking every single one of you. Right now, it doesn't matter if you get upset with me. It's okay. I'll be the man. Just hate the messenger. It's all right. But is that where we're at now? We're going to rebel against what God consecrated? What he anointed? What he set aside as holy? Just because we just don't want to be like the Jews? And inventing a new priesthood that only applies in the Bible to Yeshua in the heavenly tabernacle, not on the earth. Because even the book of Hebrews tells you that if Yeshua was on earth, he would not be a priest. But Yeshua, if he was on earth, he cannot be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. But we can? Let's continue. And the Israelites said to Moses, saying, look, we will die. We will be destroyed. All of us will perish. Anyone who approaches the tabernacle of God will die. We all die. And then God says this. And the Lord said to Aaron, you, you and your sons and the family with you will bear the iniquity of the sanctuary, the guilt. And you and your sons with you will bear the guilt of your priesthood. Moreover, your brothers with you, the tribe of Levi, the tribe of your father, that they may join to you to minister to you, you and your sons with you before the tent of meeting. They will keep your responsibility and the responsibility of all the tent. Only they may not come near the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar. Both you and they will die. They will join to you. And they will keep the responsibility of the tent of assembly for the entire service of the tent. And a stranger may not come near. Stranger. Let's find out what that word is again. Czar. Illicit. Hebrew roots people are not authorized to usurp the authority of God's priesthood. You do not have it. Yeshua never gave it to you to be in the order of Melchizedek. 
And he's the final authority for us as our rabbi, as our leader, as the son of God, as our Messiah. He never did it. So why are we doing that? Because we're rebelling against God. Not an easy message at all. So let's go to, let's go to, and I'm almost done. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 1. Let's move on from here. You can do the, the rest of the reading yourself. 1 Kings chapter 1. And let's see what happens. Let's see what, how we got to the sons of Sadok. By the way, in the book of Ezekiel, it says the sons of Sadok. It doesn't say Melchizedek in any way. Okay? Oh, my God. It's crazy. Reinventing the wheel. So now Adonai, the son of Hadi, Hagith, was exalting himself, saying, I will be king. So he prepared for himself a chariot, a horseman of 50 men running before him. His father did not rebuke him at any time by saying, why did you do this? So he was also very handsome in appearance. He was born after, uh, born him after Absalom. Now, what did he do? Watch this. He conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Aviatar, the priest. There were two high priests in the time of David. The reason why there were two high priests in the time of David is because you have the temple, I'm sorry, the tabernacle in uh, Givon. Okay. You have the tabernacle in Givon. In the time of Solomon, there were actually, um, in the time of Solomon, there were two high priests. Because the tabernacle was in one place, and the ark was in the other one. The ark was in the city of David, and the tabernacle, because of the Philistines took it, they were protecting it. So the city of David, that's where the, ta the tabernacle was. But Ovid Edom was taking care of it. And the tabernacle itself, the sacrifices were two miles north of Jerusalem in Givon. So you needed two priests to make sure everything's running. Sadok was with David in the city of David, and Abiathar was actually in Givon. Now, watch this. And it says, Abiathar, the priest, they supported Adonai. Remember, God chose Solomon. So Abiathar, the priest, he committed treason against God because he supported Adonai, whom God did not call to the priesthood. But Sadok, the priest, Beniah, the son of Jehodiah, Nathan, the prophet, Shimei, Ray, and the mighty warriors were David's, and they were not with Adonai. This is the reason why the sons of Sadok became the priests forever, because of the loyalty to David. Okay? Now, in verse 22, it says this. While she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet came in. They told the king, Nathan the prophet is here. He came into the presence of the king and bowed down before the king with his face to the ground. Nathan said, my lord, the king, have you said Adonai shall be king after me? He shall sit in my throne? For, when, for he went down today and sacrificed oxen, sheep, fattened animals in abundance. He invited all the sons of the king, the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priests. And look, they are eating and drinking before him. They have also said, Long live the king Adonai. But me, your servant, Nathan, Sadok the priest, Benaiah the son of Yehoda, Yehoiada, and Solomon your servant, did not, uh, he did not invite. If it was from my lord the king that this thing has happened, then it's all well. But if not, you must not let you must let your servant know who shall sit on the throne of my lord, the king after him. Then king answered and said, he summoned everybody, and then later on, Adonai dies. Joab also dies. Okay, so what happened to so what happens to Aviatar? Okay, because there's an enthronement. You got to go read it for yourself. Sadok becomes the one who anointed Solomon. And his loyalty to David gave him now the place that forever would be, forever would be now the, uh, the high priest. When you go to chapter 2, verse 26 to 27, right here. To Abiatar the priest, the king. Now, Solomon is already anointed, he is king. He says, go to Anathoth, to your field, for you deserve to die. But on this day I will not kill you. For you carry the ark of the Lord your God before David my father. And because you endured hardship 
in all the hardship that my father endured. So Solomon banished, he exiled Aviatar from being priest to the Lord, thus fulfilling the words which the Lord has spoken concerning the house of Eli and Shiloh. What does this mean? That because of this event, now you go to Ezekiel, and I'm almost done, I promise you. In Ezekiel, chapter 40, 43, verse, actually, 44, verse 15. I'm going to come back to 43 in a minute. No, we're going to read 40. We're going to read 43. Okay? It says, and he brought me to the gate which was facing east, and look, the glory of the Lord, and it came in the way of the east, and it sounded most like a sound of many waters. You already get this. I'm going to read from verse 2, verse 6 now, okay? And then I heard someone speaking from me from the house, and a man was standing beside me, and he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne, and the place for the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of Israel to eternity. So how in the world can the God do away with his temple when he already said that is a place when he would put his feet forever? And they, the house of Israel, they and their kings will not again defile my holy name with their fornication and with their offerings for the dead of their kings and of their high places. When they place their threshold with my threshold, their door frame beside my door frame, and the wall was between me and between them, and they defile my holy name with their detestable things that they did, so I consumed them in anger. Now let them send their fornication away from their off and the offerings from the for the dead and their kings. And then he says in verse 10, and this is the one thing no one wants to do. I get criticized all the time for quoting the Bible. You, son of man, describe to the house of Israel the temple, and let them be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. And if you are, uh, and if they are ashamed of all that they did, then the plan of the temple, its arrangements, and its exits, its entrances, and all its plans, and all its statues, means chukah. The word there is chukah. There we go. All the statues and all his plans and all of his laws. Make known to them and write them before their eyes so that they may remember all of its plans and all of his statues so that they do them. This is the law of the temple on the top of the mountain, all of its territory and all the way around. It is most holy. The word there is kadosh kodashim. Kadosh HaKodeshim, it uses the word Kadosh, most holy, holy, yeah, Kadosh HaKodeshim, there it is, in the bottom. If you read Hebrew, you can see in the bottom right there. But people say, the Hebrew roots are saying, now it's in the city of David. It's not on the Temple Mount, on top of the mountain. Now, not only is the priesthood now usurped, but also now the calendars and the feasts, but also now the Temple is moved out of its location. God help us, Okay? Let's continue. When you go to verse 18, it says, And he said to me, Son of man, thus says the Lord God, These are the statues of the altar on the day when it is made to sacrifice a burnt offering on it and to sprinkle blood on it. You must give it to the Levitical priests who are from the offspring of Sadok. It doesn't say Melchizedek. The ones coming near me, declares the Lord God, who ser to serve me, a bull and a calf and a sin offering. Let me continue because he keeps mentioning their names. Verse 22. And on the second day you must offer a he goat without defect as a sin offering. You must purify the altar like they purify with a bull. When you are finished from purifying, you must offer a bull. Let me read verse 24. And you must bring them near before the Lord and the priests must throw salt on them and they must offer them as a burnt offering to God. For seven days you must provide a goat of sin offering for the day uh, for the day and a bull. Verse 26. Seven days you must purify the altar. So I take seven days to dedicate the altar. And you must cleanse it. So they will be so they will consecrate it, the priest. And they will finish the days and then on the eighth day and beyond that the priest will offer on the altar your burnt offering and your fellow offerings, fellowship offerings, and I will be pleased with you, declares the Lord. Who are the people who approach him? Sadok. Now Melchizedek, it doesn't say that in the text. We have to stop adding stuff to the text. 
And the Lord says in chapter 44, verse 5, And the Lord says, Son of man, set your heart to look with your eyes and with your ears, hear everything I am saying to you concerning all the statues of the temple. What is the word statues right here? Chuka. Again, decrees of God, ordinances. And concerning all of his laws, do you know the law, do you know the laws of the temple? Do you know the statutes of the temple? If you did, we would not be changing the priesthood. You must listen with your heart concerning the entrance of the temple, with all its exits and of the sanctuary. You must say to the rebellious, the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord Adonai, Enough for you, house of Israel. All of your detestable things, and your bringing foreigners who are uncircumcised, of heart and uncircumcised of flesh to be in my sanctuary to profane it, my temple. As you offer my food, fat, and blood, so you broke my covenant by all your detestable things. Detestable here means, uh, let me see what the word says here. It should say um, tuma, hopefully it does. No, toeva, worse. Toeva actually means moral behavior. You did not observe the responsibility of my sanctuary, but you appointed them as keepers of my responsibility in my sanctuary for you. Thus says the Lord Elohim, every foreigner uncircumcised of heart and uncircumcised of flesh shall not come into my sanctuary, not any of the foreigners who are in the midst of Israel. Verse 15, but the Levitical priests, the descendants of Sadok, who care for the responsibility of my sanctuary. When the children of Israel, when the Israel went astray from me, they will approach me to serve me, and they will stand before me to offer me the fat and the blood, declares Adonai Elohim. Who's going to challenge God? Who's going to challenge him? He said it. They shall come to my sanctuary, and they shall approach my table to serve me, and they will observe my requirements. Keeps going. You got to read it on your own. In verse 23, this is the authority God gave the priests, sons of Aaron, from the line of Sadok. And they will teach my people the difference between the holy and what is unholy. The difference between the unclean and the clean. They must show them. And at a legal dispute, they themselves shall stand to judge. Employ my judgments, they shall judge it. And with respect to my laws and my statutes, all my festivals they shall keep. And my Sabbath they shall consecrate. They are the ones who consecrate the feast. Make them holy. Not people who just came into the kingdom who accepted Yeshua yesterday, and now they're changing the calendars because every feast was connected with a sacrificial system. Numbers 28 and 29. The new moon, Passover, Pentecost, Yom Ter uh, Shavuot, uh, yeah, uh, Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, all of them are connected with the sacrificial system. I'm going to leave it here. So my question is this. If you are now high priest in the order of Melchizedek, I need you to show me proof where and when were you anointed, ordained, consecrated, the laying of the hands, and you had a covenantal meal that included a sacrifice. I need to know that because that's the biblical protocol of the, anoint, of the ritual that was performed to consecrate the sons of Aaron to do their work. Because God consecrated them instead of the sons of Israel, according to Numbers chapter 3. I need to know, how come Yeshua never mentioned Melchizedek in the 40 days after the resurrection? I need to know why John, Peter, James, and none of the disciples ever said anything about the Melchizedek priesthood to anybody. It would have been a perfect opportunity for all the disciples and the leadership to say, great. All those Gentiles can come and be high priests in the order of Melchizedek. No one ever said that. Why? I need to know. How come Hebrews is only in reference to Yeshua as a high priest in the order of Melchizedek in the heavenly tabernacle? And it also states that he will not be even be a priest on the earth because he was, not, he was already priest according to the law. So I, I come back and repeat again. How is it that now Yeshua cannot be a priest on the earth, but you can? And a high priest into the Holy Holies and sit there with the Lord as if he's your daddy? My king should be respected. My king, there's a protocol that he has established. We're not honorable enough to go and meet with him in the holy place or the Holy Holies. It's by the mercy of Yeshua 
through Yeshua, by the God's mercy, through Yeshua, that we are even in this kingdom. And what are we doing? We are usurping the authority of the people that God said are holy to Him. I showed you over 50 verses. I need you to give me two verses that literally says, like it has literally says, that the sons of Aaron, Aaron and his sons, then Sadok, sons of Aaron. It tells you all the evidence I've shown you. I just need to see one or two verses. I don't want opinions. I don't want your spiritual application. I want us to, just like I just went over here and give you all the verses, it's up to you to say, okay, I want, you, I want to show you all the verses that literally says anywhere in the Bible that you and I are called to be high priests on the earth in the order of Melchizedek. And you don't have to agree with me. I just want you to show me the evidence. Show me the evidence. I already showed you mine. And there's only the beginning. I didn't even really show you all of it. I just, the verses that I could just put together right before I talk. And I left about 20 of them. Okay? So, please, before we criticize and we challenge people's integrity, because I'm trying to defend what God said is holy, we need to know our place. We are Israel. It's not enough that He has given us salvation through Yeshua the Messiah. It's not enough that we can come near the Father now through Yeshua. Now we want the priesthood too. I pray that we will consider and study it. I want you guys not to believe what I say. Go back and validate and, 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 and read everything I said. But there's no evidence in the New Testament, but there's all kinds of evidence in the Torah and the prophets that supports. It tells us they were priests who believe in Yeshua in the New Testament. And they never stopped working. It doesn't say, hey, these people stopped believing. They stopped working in the temple after they believe in Yeshua. It doesn't say that anywhere. You assume they kept doing their work. It's like you're going to a doctor who's an atheist, and now the doctor who's your doctor now believes in Yeshua. Is he going to stop being a doctor because he believes in Yeshua? No, worse. You're going to teach him to be a high priest now when his job is to be a doctor. Let us return. Let us come back. If this was a just a spiritual application, maybe hundreds of people would be on right now. But I'm challenging the status quo with the word, with the scriptures. I showed you what the word chukah means. I showed you what the word czar, stranger, means. The Lord judge, even the priests, the sons of Aaron, because they went in unauthorized and they died. The Lord shows us that he took care of a king of Israel because he challenged the authority of the priesthood by doing something he was not authorized. I showed you the evidence of King Saul doing the same thing too. And I showed you the evidence of the children of Israel in the wilderness with Korah. Aren't we not going to learn a lesson? Is that what we want to happen to us? I did my best and I pray I did it from the heart. I did my best to present the information. I don't mean it to do it in arrogance. I don't mean it to do it to belittle anybody. I'm concerned that what we are doing can create a lot of issues for the kingdom. Please, let us reconsider our ways. Please, allow God to be God and His Word to be holy. And let us believe what it says. Study the temple. And if I'm wrong, I'm willing to change. I'm willing to do it. I promise you I will. But I'm not presenting this because I want to be right. I'm presenting it because that's the evidence I see. And I have to stand on the evidence. And the Spirit of God can never go against His own Bible. The Spirit of God can never go against the decrees that God Himself established. Because these things were established on Mount Sinai. As, as it says in Numbers chapter 28, verse 1 through 6. All of this stuff was ordained by God. You want to continue to challenge Him? I'm a witness. If He challenges it, I'm a witness against you. Because that's our duty. We need to keep each other accountable. And we're going way outside the realm of reality right now. We are leading in a way that is dangerous. Let us not do that. Please, let us return. Let us become one. Let us sit down and talk. The leadership is not talking to each other. Leaders don't, don't talk to each other. Why don't we get together and bring this information out? 
Let's study the Bible together. Forget about being right and focusing on each other's ministries. Why don't we just get together and say, this is a problem. This is a problem in the Hebrew roots. And it will continue as long as the leadership will not stand and put our egos aside and say, let's sit down and look at what the Bible says in context. We can have the arguments and closed doors. It's okay. But if we leave and we come out, okay, guys, we study the Bible, we research it, we hurt each other, we don't necessarily agree on everything, but on these core issues we do and we establish that order and we teach it as a kingdom, then the Lord will truly bless us with the duty and the job that he has called us to, to do. In the meantime, more chaos, more confusion. I don't care about views. I just want to be a servant of God and do what is right. If only one listens to it, so be it. But at least I did what I could based on the information I have today. If tomorrow there's more information that I don't have that actually proves that my position is incorrect, I promise you I come on the air and say, guys, I was wrong. But so far, it's too many verses to refute because it's God's word. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Consider studying with us at wisdomandtorah.com. And so some of you that may not want to study with us, it's okay. Thank you for hearing, at least giving me the opportunity to share this with you. And you don't have to agree with me, at least listen to it. You have nothing to lose. Look at the Bible, validate it. Go back. I'm giving you the resources. I'm doing what very few people are willing to do. Open the Bible, show you the text in Hebrew, show you the verses, read it for what it says. Many people don't even want to cite sources. And we need to change that. If we're going to teach, we got to be accountable. Okay? Shalom to all of you. Bye-bye.